Hey everyone, welcome to LED Live. How much money is enough money to make you happy? Find out on this episode of LED Live. Light exposing darkness. Welcome everyone to LED Live. We're so glad you could join us on another episode. We're excited to present the last part in this it's kind of a series, you know, that we've been doing, talking about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And so we're going to uh, dive deep into that today. Uh, also want to thank our patrons. You guys are the ones who help make this channel possible. If you don't know anything about Patreon, we can put something on the screen to direct you. Just go to patreon.com, look up Little Light Studios, or check out the link in the description below. It'll take you right to it, and you can find out by supporting us, you get all these cool perks. Some donors, they get exclusive t-shirts, some get digital download DVDs. You get exclusive behind the scene access, all kinds of stuff, so check Patreon out. Here's some of the stickers that we have. If you want more, you can check it on our website. And you know, by uh, purchasing the st stickers, you also help us toward making more of this video free on YouTube. That's so right. check us out. Yeah, you could have a whole outfit going on. You could. Right. You could. On your phone. There you go, matching. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Or they could go on here like this. Water so. bottles. They look great on, on water cap. bottles. That's right. <laughs> you, uh, these are like three bucks on our website. We ship them free. So yeah. check those out. Uh, we do have one bumper sticker. It's a little more money. So <laughs> might it check says, that one out. Jesus makes America great. It's awesome. That's right. I love it. He does. <laughs> Okay, we also have t-shirts. Tell us about t-shirts, Scotty. Mm -hmm. T-shirts, we make t-shirts to help support our ministry. We actually really uh, uh, like the idea of just creating an opportunity for you to share your witness. And uh, t-shirts is a great sort of uh, a voice that maybe you uh, don't say the words, but it's printed on your shirt. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we also have not just t-shirts, but you can get sweatshirts, sweaters, socks, iPhone ca <laughs> um, cases, you name it. If you click on the little link called Teespring right below the video here, you can see an endless things that you can put these different graphics onto. And uh, pretty soon we'll have actually a t-shirt operation of our own back on our website which actually really helps us more and, and gives our ministry more of the funding, which helps us create more projects. So yep. if you guys want to help support, that's a great way to do that. And we also have a Spanish channel, but we're going a little bit further. Tell us about that, Kendi. Yeah, a lot of you have reached out to us on our social media platforms or sent emails really wanting to get the Little Light Studios episodes, the, the message, the gospel out to people who don't speak either English or Spanish. People want to hear these messages in their native tongue. So we have listened and put together Little Light Studios International channel on YouTube. It's very much community based it it relies on the submissions of people who either want to well all of our videos are open to subtitling yep. but some people have reached out saying it's better to dub the videos so people can listen and not just be reading all the time so if that's something you're interested in if you speak another language um, other than Spanish or English and you would like to help us out reach out, out to us on on Facebook Instagram little less studios that TV and um, let's let's help that channel to grow so more people all around the world can enjoy little Ice studios productions. And I think we've actually had quite a few of our productions in different languages. I mean, I've yeah. I've seen from French, Russian, German, you name it, like translated, yeah. actually dubbed over as well. So if you know of anybody that's already done the work yeah. or you know of any channel, send us a link or something so that we could actually offer that on our Little Light Studios International channel as well and bless many other people who have different languages. All right, so we've been talking about the verses from John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, which talk about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And today, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the pride of life. And we've been having this theme that we've been talking about, moving from devotion to desire. And that is what this world is geared to. That is what Satan is trying to get each one of us to do, is move from devotion to desire. And so what we need to be focused on is what does God want? What does God want for our lives? So today's topic, the pride of life. Um, the more we are transformed into these other images that we're looking at all the time, the more I think that can easily turn into self-dependence, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. Because we're trying to maintain that image. 
And then we oftentimes thirst for more, greater aspirations of what that looks like. And that means less dependence on God. So I want to show you guys a few articles today. One is from uh, Psychology Today. This is eight crucial differences between unhealthy and healthy pride. And I'm not going to go through all of those. I went through this and picked out a few that I thought were relevant. So here it says that um, unhealthy pride depicts an overtly favorable evaluation of self based on giving oneself too much credit for accomplishments that typically are rather modest, hmm. such as overvaluing one's abilities or achievements and can relate to attributing oneself success that belongs as much or more to others involved in whatever task or project was successfully completed. Okay, so real word example. I don't know if you've ever watched football before, but you know, if a team's doing really bad, whose fault is it? It's the coach or the quarterback, you know, it couldn't possibly be the whole team, right? <laughs> right, and so what do they do? They cycle out the coach, they cycle out the quarterback, and it's like, okay, now everything's better. Mm. Now, granted, those are positions of leadership and they're important, but you know, is it really only attributed to Tom Brady, for example? Like, is that it? What it's talking about here when it's talking about unhealthy pride is what we would simply call pride in the Bible, right? So this is coming from a secular source. So we got to kind of keep that in mind. Um, but notice how it says an overly favorable evaluation of self based on giving oneself too much credit or accomplishments that are typically rather modest. modest. Aren't we good at that? Aren't we good at being like, man, I did so good. Pat and, myself really yeah. fast. Don't break my arm, you know, pat myself on the back. <laughs> Call them attaboys. I need an attaboy. Yeah. <laughs> it's so easy to lift yourself up or inflate your abilities or, you know, like, yeah, I did that or that was all me or what have you. When really, you know, you don't get through life without other people no, helping you. Like even from the very beginning, like, you had to be born and somebody had to take care of you at some point, right? <laughs> Here's another point. On the contrary, unhealthy pride is far more aggressive and explicit. Uh, it's a declaration not only of competence as such, but of personal superiority. It frequently takes on the form of looking down on others or putting them down. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how you get to the top, right? right. You gotta yeah. step on everybody all the way up. <laughs> And if you want to make yourself look better, you see people do this. To make themselves look better, they have to put, put everybody else down, down, down. Right. around them. Yep. Which you're not really raising the standard, you're just lowering it, yeah. mm -hmm. if you think about it. My, my son, he's eight years old, um, actually experienced this the other day. He was over at a friend's house, and there was a lot of other friends that were over there. And um, it, was a, it was a new house that they had just been in, and one of the little boys had never been there before, and he walked into the little kid's room. He looked right around, and he goes, why is your room terrible? <laughs> like that. Wow. And my son was just like, why would you, why would you say that? <laughs> and it, it impacted him enough to come home and talk about it. And he, he brought it up, and he said that was really a strange comment that he made. Like, like he'd never been there before. Why would right. he say his room was terrible? And his room was, they live in like a brand new house. <laughs> and... So I had this conversation with him. I said, you know, sometimes when people feel, um, you know, like threatened or something, they'll tear you down so that they mm -hmm. feel better about what they have. And perhaps maybe this little boy that made that comment doesn't have the same kind of thing. So he wants to feel better about his mm -hmm. own stuff, mm. making fun of yeah. the other boy. You ever heard that? My dad can beat up your dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's another one. I got to teach my kid that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's another point this article brought out. It says... On the contrary, unhealthy pride links to what is generally deemed antagonistic, antisocial, or rule-breaking behaviors. Hmm. Hmm. What's interesting is you look at those qualities, and I find that at least a couple of them is exactly how the Bible describes the fallen angel from heaven, Lucifer, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. He was a rule-breaker. It says this in Isaiah. It says in verses 13 and 14 of chapter 14, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Hmm. Now, this is what we call an eye problem, right? <laughs> Not this eye problem, but a me problem, right? Everything about himself in this passage is being elevated above everything and everyone else, right? right? So Lucifer's appetite for more, it never ends. Mm -hmm. 
He's always got to have more. He believed that being beautiful, actually, if you read the text closely, entitled him to more. Mm -hmm. I'm so good looking, right? (laughs) That's why I deserve all this. Mm -hmm. Just like we see people who are beautiful today and they think more highly, uh, we think more highly of them sometimes because of the halo effect, right? Right. This happened within himself. Hmm. The halo effect going on inside. Hmm. You know, looks at himself, sees himself, man, I I deserve so much more, Mm -hmm. you know? Does fulfilling our desires make us happy? That's a great question. What do you guys think? On the surface? Yeah, I think it depends on what <laughs> yeah. your desires are. Mm-hmm. If you have healthy desires, you know, and, and like I desire to be a more healthy individual. I want to run. I want to eat healthy. I want to do mm-hmm. these kind of things, right? If I fulfill those activities, I'm generally going to feel better. But if you have unhealthy tastes, mm-hmm. then I, I think it's damaging. Yeah, I think it depends also on the motive. Do you yeah. want it for like selfish thing yeah. or for helping other people? That's actually a good point because yeah. you can actually use health even working out. Yeah. I used to work at a gym, and I mean, you see those guys just in front of the mirror <laughs> all the time, you yeah. know, like, which way is the gym, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it can be an unhealthy thing to be healthy like that, too. Yeah, I can. So typically when we think about this, we think about it in the worldly perspective, right? And, and the worldly perspective says, if I have more, I will be more happy. Right. Right. right? A bigger house, a bigger bank account, whatever it is, certain features of your body accentuated, a better education, whatever it is, as long as we have more of it, I'll be satisfied. Have That's you guys me. ever known anybody really, 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 really wealthy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And did you ever spend a lot of time with them? I mean, like, enough to like, know, like, you know, were they generally happy? Oh, no. I've actually only been friends with somebody that that would quote unquote be you know extremely well off, and they said that it was very fearful, like you constantly have this anxiety, people out to get you, out to get your money, you may lose it, you may you know there's a lot of like that old saying there's more more money more problems. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I I have nothing to compare that to because I've never been in that position, but. Um, yeah, sometimes I don't envy the uber wealthy. Is that why you said one time that you'd want to be an undercover wealthy person? That's right, that's right. <laughs> I, I would live the same, you know? Yeah. Find out who to, like, support and give money to, and then I would never tell them. Mm. Millionaire next door. <laughs> what is desire? Let's take a look at this article. I think this is from the Huffington Post. It says, our desire points us outward to the world of objects. It suggests that our anxiety is created by not having something. And we talked about that earlier, how the world is this, it does this good job of creating this emptiness, you know, so that it can be filled. It says a job, a relationship, a shopping spree, and that if we were to just fill this void, we would be happy, you know, fill the hole. If we were interested in resolving this anxiety as quickly as possible, we might turn to the most obvious solution, which is to give our desire the food it is asking for. When we, sat, when we satiate our desire, we receive a taste of happiness, the desireless state. This lasts only until we feel another void, mm. right? Which triggers another anxiety and another desire and so on. And you can see it doesn't end. It just keeps going and going and going. And this is one of the ways the advertising industry works, right? They have to create a dissatisfaction within you in order to be able to fill it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then they're constantly creating dissatisfaction so they can, heal the, they can fill the hole that they created. Mm-hmm. Even when you're wealthy, there's always someone more wealthy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like you can like see there's levels even within that. And, yeah. and there's, there seems to be no end to that satisfaction. Right. So here's another, uh, this is an interesting perspective. Now, this is coming from a secular news source. So they're drawing from all kinds of different people. This particular spin that they're put on uh, is actually a Hindu perspective. But having said that, I think what they're saying is true. Okay. So listen to this. As we grow spiritually, we begin to want less for ourselves personally Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and care more about the welfare of others. Mm -hmm. It is not that we stop taking care of our own mental and physical needs. 
but that we realize the chasing of our personal desires does not lead to the freedom it seems to promise. When we realize this, we naturally lose interest in fulfilling every personal desire that crosses our minds. Hmm. So very insightful. I think it's true. Uh, I'm not suggesting that uh, Hinduism leads to happiness. I think that kind of happiness is only found in Christianity, in Jesus. But I do believe that what they're saying is true, uh, specifically in that, in the right context. Yeah, when you're accepting um, to kind of make it broad, like a higher power, but for us it would mm -hmm. be Jesus Christ, a savior outside of yourself. There's mm -hmm. just this contentment yeah. right. that you feel. And yeah, as they're saying, like, of course you're gonna be passionate about things and go after things, mm -hmm. but it's just not your drive anymore. Like that's right. Like, mm -hmm. I think it's true because you're not serving yourself anymore. And I think that is just a principle that God has set in motion. Mm -hmm. You know, serving yourself doesn't lead to happiness, but serving other people does. So if you find that same principle in other religions, I think it, it really started with, you know, God. And, right. But, you know, other things have found that that is true. It's just a principle of life. We see this in Genesis 3, 5. It says, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil, right? Notice what Satan is doing here. He's creating a void where none really existed. We talked about this on the last show in this series. Was there any reason for Eve to be insecure? No. <laughs> no, there wasn't, right? He was exploring something that was good for her to desire, to be like uh, God, and to have knowledge. These are good things, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But anything she wanted to know... All she had to do was ask God, right? And she was already like him in the respect that she was made in his image. Mm -hmm. So if she wanted knowledge, she had the ultimate source of knowledge at her disposal already. Mm -hmm. Just ask, whatever you wanna know, just ask, mm -hmm. right? But now think about this. This is, um, this is a, a really powerful insinuation that he makes here with this verse, Eve, do you really want to be like someone who is withholding? Hmm. Do you really want to be like someone who is keeping something good from you? Hmm. Good in right. quotes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Do you really want to be like God? Mm -hmm. And then he's really insinuating you could be like God apart from God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And really fulfilling her desires did not make her happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah e immediately I can imagine that she went back and maybe had a little bit of an argument with her husband, you know? Yeah. Like, like especially a little bit of a, a kind of a quarrel. And as that first time, I mean, you can tell the effects were immediate. Mm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm actually working on a, a sermon for church for this, but... Um, the, the ideas I'm kind of tracing this through the Bible is, is, if you think about it, he's implying that there is a good gift that God is not willing to give. Hmm. Now follow that line of the reasoning all throughout scripture. Then she takes what she thinks is the good gift and she goes to offer that good gift to her husband, right? And then after everything falls apart, right? The wheels have come off the train you know, obviously the husband doesn't appreciate the gift he was given. Mm -hmm. Both relationships, the relationship between man and God is broken. The relationship between man and man is broken, mm -hmm. right? So, which is why it comes in later when Jesus talks about, you know, love God with all your heart, mind, strength, and your soul, and your neighbor as yourself, right? Mm -hmm. right? Is because that's what was broken in the beginning. And so if you think about it, God is now in this position where he has to prove that he will not hold any good gift. Hmm. And so what links does God have to go to? Hmm. He has to go to the ultimate gift. The ult like this is the best thing I could ever give and I'm yeah. gonna show you I'm not gonna withhold it. Wow. So that's really what's behind all of this uh, insinuation that the devil is really getting at with Eve. So 
Uh, let's look at a few more studies. Harvard study says that the key to happiness isn't fame or fortune. It's not. You it's should. Not. <laughs> Has anybody here ever thought about being rich? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen that clip from Jim Carrey that says, I wish everybody could be famous for a little while just to mm. know that you don't want this. Right. Wow. Take a walk in my oh. shoes. Yeah, you know, yeah. and I think that if you could experience it for a little bit, you'd probably be m more content with what you have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think we can all agree, we've probably all thought about being rich at some point, right? Uh, my, my personal fantasy is, fantasy is like having my own personal island, right? <laughs> and being able to go there anytime. <laughs> um, but if you were rich, what would you do with the money? Right now? Give it away. <laughs> really? <laughs> just like, no. I mean, maybe I'd keep just enough for like a Tesla and a boat and, you know, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just a few things. Yeah. But I think, I think there's, there's a blessing in giving, and I've seen people that have been really uber giving with like generous hearts. And you see something in that that, that God is, is pronounced. I mean, doesn't the Bible say it's better to give than to receive, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that if you really understood that principle, I think there's an amount of satisfaction in giving. I, I heard on the radio the other day, um, do you know who Tchaikovsky is? The piano Ch player? Tchaikovsky? Ch yeah. Ch yeah. Okay, yeah. You can tell how much I listened. Yeah, I, I listened to uh, classical music. But they were talking about it. I was listening to classical music. And um, they said that there was a woman that when he was in his 20s and 30s that um, contacted him. And he was kind of floundering around, wasn't able to really make ends meet. And she said, I will take care of your money until the day you are, you're done. You will have a check always to do this. But I have one rule. You can never see my face. And so through his whole existence, he created music. Wow. And somebody funded him. And he never met her except for on his deathbed. The lady showed up. Wow. And it was a very wealthy lady. And she said, I have invested a lot in you, and I can see that my investment was well worth everything that I paid into it. Wow. And, and she had this little just pleasurable um, thing where she just was, was helping this one person create, you know, resources for people to enjoy. And I just think that's so neat. Like, you know, if I was wealthy, I would love to do something like that where just, you know, they don't, they don't even know. Right. Yeah. Well, having a lot of money, it sounds great, right? I think we can all agree on that. But according to this study, it suggests that money and fame do not fulfill our happiness. So what do they mean by that? A long-running Harvard research team suggests the most important predictor of whether you live a long and happy life isn't related to the amount of money you'll amass or the notoriety you receive, mm -hmm. but how you get on with your loved ones. Mm. So it's relationships. It is relationships. Mm -hmm. So a huge punchline, right? It's your relationships. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the world today, nation after nation, culture after culture, home after home, humanity is just a string of broken relationships. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's a lot of people on their deathbed that when they're recounting their regrets, they're saying, I wish I would have bought another boat. I wish I would have bought another house. I wish I would have bought all these other things. I think a lot of them are regretting. I wish I would have spent more time with my kids. Mm -hmm. I wish I would have spent more time with my spouse, more time with my friends, you know, mm -hmm. because that they can see at the end of the day is what means something. Towards the end of this article, it says this, something as simple as replacing screen time, we're in favor of that, <laughs> <laughs> with people time, or livening up a stale relationship by doing something new together like long walks or date nights. I need more date nights. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you that right now. Oh. Mm -hmm. So spending time with people. And you know what's really amazing? This is where the wisdom of God shines. God built this into humanity from the very beginning. He set aside the seventh day of the week for relationships, for spending time with people. And you can see that in the Sabbath commandment. It comes from Exodus 20, 10 and 11. So I'm not going to read that, but you guys can look that up, dwell upon it, think about it. It's very, very relational. And it's about the relation between man to man and God to man, right? The mm -hmm. thing that was broken in the Garden of Eden. How you think about money, this is from uh, CNBC, I think. How you think about money can impact how happy you are in life, a study says. So did you know that there is a number 
the magic number, at least in the U.S. I don't know what it is for other countries, okay? okay. This is the happiness number for money. Okay. One million dollars. <laughs> okay, what's your guess, That's Michelle? Uh, more than so one million. Not in a lifetime, like some, like what annually. you have right now. Annual. Annually. Oh, annually? Yes. Mm. Maybe a hundred grand. Three hundred? No. So, hundred grand, three hundred grand. Yeah. What do you think? Let's go five. Five hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Well, you guys are like high, high <laughs> rollers. It actually turns out it's not that high. So a Princeton study in 2010 uh, found out there's a correlation between happiness and wealth to a point of about $75,000 per year. I won. You got the closest. <laughs> when people so. make more than $75,000 a year, their happiness doesn't increase. But the lower the income is, the worse they feel the study found out. So you can't be more miserable making less money, for sure, but you can't be any happier, according to the study, by making more than that. Hmm. And if I think about it, and I think, you know, I think, you know, of course this number is, it could change from year to year, decade to decade, you know, based on inflation and, you know, cost of living and all that kind of stuff. But if you think about it, the number is, it's like, it's enough to take care of my needs and my family's needs. I have a little bit extra to do things that I would enjoy. I have enough extra that I could be able to help somebody and give. I can save, but it's not so much money that I'm paranoid about maintaining it right. or somebody's gonna try to, you know, off me to get my money or steal from me. But anyway, having more apparently will not make you happier. So this is from Mark Psychiatry. Fame, money, beauty do not bring happiness, okay? What does it have to say in this article? The things that make you happy in life are growing as an individual, having loving relationships and contributing to your community. Wow. So there you go. They're in agreement, right? Reinforcing the earlier point. Happiness is about relationships. It's not about your bank account. They said the greatest satisfaction came from a, the achievement of intrinsic goals, such as personal growth, building relationships, improving the community, and physical fitness that met the basic psychological needs of autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a, there's a, a simple amount of, of things that are within everybody's means that can make you happy. Sure. You know what I mean? Everybody can have a, have a relationship, if maybe not a spouse or, or you know, someone of the opposite gender, um, you can easily have a church family, or mm -hmm. you can have friends or neighbors mm -hmm. or whatever. And, um, you know, it's amazing. That if you're friendly to people, how much people mm -hmm. will be friendly back to you. If you smile at people, how much people will smile and respond back mm -hmm. to you. That's what the Bible says, right? He who desires to have friends must be friendly. Mm -hmm. Inc. Magazine said this, Harvard study of 4,000 millionaires revealed something surprising about money and happiness. They found that if you want you and your heirs to be happier, you should give your money away and let them make it on their own. Mm -hmm. Was that? Wait, wait, <laughs> sorry. So let me get that straight. Give all your money away, but let who make it on your own? Your kids. Let their kids make it on their oh, own. Oh, that's that's exactly what um, Steve Jobs' wife mm -hmm. is doing. Yeah. He, that that's. Do you know what her name is? No. Mrs. I'll show Jobs. you. <laughs> it's uh, Lauren Powell Jobs. Actually, everybody on this list: Bill and Melinda Gates, Warren Buffett, Mark Zuckerberg, Mackenzie Bezos, George Lucas, Sting, Jackie Chan, Elton John. Gloria Vanderbilt, Andrew Lloyd Webber, Ashton Kutcher, Gordon Ramsay, Lord and Pal Jobs, Michael Bloomberg, all these people, they're like, we're giving our money away. So if wow. any of you guys listening are one of these people <laughs> and you would like to give to our ministry. Um, now, in some cases, it's all of it. Like Warren, Warren Buffett's like really strong on this. He's like, my kids aren't getting a dime. Yeah. Wow. Like the most I will do is give I mean, to a charity in their name. That's fine. They have his knowledge. They have the name. Right. They'll be yeah. fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Other people are this like, is probably true. you know, the gates aren't quite that harsh. They're like, we want to give them enough that they can have a good start mm -hmm. and enough to do something, but not so much that it's like a waste, mm -hmm. you know? And that, that was like Jackie Chan too. That's what he said. He's like, the way I'm looking at it is like, if my kid isn't responsible with my money, I would be ticked off to mm -hmm. leave it to him, you know? Mm -hmm. That list goes on. Ted Turner, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Aaron Spelling, James Brown, Gene Simmons, Oprah, Pierre o, um, Omid Dayar, and Bernie Marcus. 
Pierre is the co-founder of eBay, and Bernie Marcus is the co-founder of Home Depot. So here's a question then. Do you think that the people, I mean, these people are all names that we've probably heard half of them, right? At least. Or we use their products or services. And um, do you think that they realize that money corrupts? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, at that top level, are they literally like, the reason why I wouldn't pass it on to my kids, it'd be like passing on a curse to my children, you know what I mean? I mean, that's a good point. We're just about to get into uh, why they're not satisfied with their wealth. All these people um, have recognized there's something about wealth that they don't want to pass all that to their kids. Came across something in the Atlantic that says the reason many ultra rich people aren't satisfied with their wealth. You would think if I just had more, if I had all this money, I'd be satisfied. I mean, I could buy anything that I want, right? Anytime. At least had 75 grand. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Like, we know that. We're in ministry. So here's what it said. What drives people, once they've reached that point, to keep pursuing more? This is the question. What, what drives them? Why do they want to keep going after more and more and more? And the reason is um, they're asking themselves questions. Am I doing better than I was before? And am I doing better than other people? Mm-hmm. Right. That's What's, what they're asking themselves? That's what they're asking themselves. Okay. And here's the challenge. Um, a lot of the things that really matter in life, according to this article, are hard to measure. Yeah. If you think about it, mm-hmm. right? So if you wanted to be a good parent, it's a little hard to know if you're being a better, better parent now than you were a year ago. Like, how mm-hmm. do you measure that, right? And it says it's also hard to know if you're a better parent than the neighbors. <laughs> how would you know, right? You just, you just know like what your experience is you might talk to other parents and find out you're not alone you know their kid acts up so does yours but how do you know if you're a better parent well they go on it says because you don't know the answer to these questions right so people turn to dimensions of comparison that can be quantified how do i know if i'm doing better money is a terrific one the author of this article says If I need to know if I'm doing better than I was, the easy way is to ask, am I making more money? Or does my house have more square feet? Or do I have more houses than I used to? Mm -hmm. Right? You can measure money. Mm -hmm. That's easy. Mm -hmm. But you can't measure some of these other things in life. So we just kind of default to what's easy to measure. And we use that to drive you know, whether or not we're being successful. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense. He also said the instinct is to measure and to compare. It doesn't disappear once people have an obscene amount of money. The problem is, am I doing better than I was, is only moving people in one direction up, Mm. right? That's the only direction you have to go. Mm. You can only go up. No other other, um, way to measure that. And then they say the sensation of being well off, uh, talking about somebody that they were writing to in an email, is not about fulfilling a childhood dream of buying a sailboat or something. Feeling wealthy is about a comparison with others in your reference group. So the question is not what individuals want to buy, but what they feel they must buy in order to keep their status. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, have you ever heard of keeping up with the Joneses? Oh, yeah. Apparently, that does not stop even if you're uber wealthy. Yeah, no, because there's always someone more wealthy than you and better stuff and bigger houses and play toys. Yeah, so am I doing better? I don't know. Like, am I making more money? Is my house bigger? I mean, that's that's how you're measuring it. What's interesting is, like, I love technology. Like, Mm -hmm. I I actually (laughs) have to stop myself from (laughs) obsessing over technology. And I've, I've really fallen in love with Apple. Apple has taken lots of my money over I second the years. That. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, have you ever bought a phone and you, you're so excited about yes. the phone and you're just like, this is the best phone ever. And then a month later, you're just like, eh, you do the same phone. three things that you it's used just to. A phone. <laughs> right? Like six generations ago, did the same thing that this phone does. It's yeah. just like, why did I need but this one? But it has a better one? camera. Yeah, I need this one. And so I, I, I can identify with that. Just, you know, it, it seems like when you achieve what you get, It's not the thing that lasts, you know? It's not the most fulfilling. So have you ladies heard of Cameron Diaz? Yeah. 
Okay. Yes. <laughs> we have to ask because on the last show it was like, Cindy Crop, and you're like, who's that? <laughs> so I'm going to show you a clip from Cameron Diaz, who is a very successful actress. You know, she's made lots of money. She's been in lots of films. I want to hear you. Uh, I want you to hear what she has to say about happiness. Okay. Okay. If when people say, oh, I want to be like you, I want to be an actor, I want to look like you, the question I always ask them is why? Like, really, why? And people, and especially America, this idea of fame, that to be famous means that you're successful, that you've, you're happy. It's not about, I, I don't do what I do because I want to be famous. That's part of, being famous is my job. That's, I am not, when I'm home, I am not and I'm with my family and my friends, I am not famous, I am me, and I'm Cameron, and that doesn't, fame does not define me. And so if you are looking for fame to define you, then you will never be happy, and you will always be searching for happiness, and it, you will never find it in fame. And so it goes back to, I think for me, authenticity, intention, why do you wanna do anything you do? It should not be motivated by something that you think is going to make fulfillment comes from within you by being authentic to yourself, not ch chasing fame. Wow. I, I like the idea of being authentic. I really do. Like, I appreciate people, even if they have a different point of view than me, mm -hmm. as long as they're owning it and, and you can tell, like, that's really their, you know, you know, and they're doing it in a nice way or whatever like this, like a difference of opinion. But I suppose you could be authentically satanic, you know what I mean, or <laughs> yeah. whatever. That doesn't mean that's necessarily good just because you're authentic to yourself. I don't know if that would be the end all be all of, of happiness, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I think I know what she's getting at, but yeah, kind of her comments toward the end, I don't know that I would 100% agree with that, mm -hmm. you know, that it's all about within you and all that. I think it's from God having a relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, um, Fame I get what she's getting at. You know? Fame is not cracked up to be what, it, what everybody thinks it is. And the little amount that I spent in Hollywood and the few celebrities that I really did know, I mean, that, that was literally what I found out, was that you see it on the outside as something totally different as on the inside. And it's just not the same. It's a fantasy that they're selling to everyone. And when you get mm -hmm. inside the fantasy, it's like, this is it, you know, it's like, what? Yeah, that's the wisdom I was given in high school in choosing your career, pick something that you would do regardless of whether you're being paid or not. Yeah. And that's yeah. what, um, that's more, that's the thing that you would get into and probably last a lot longer because you're enjoying what you're doing. If you're going in because of the fame or the money, I mean, mm -hmm. that that's such an Please. emotional mm -hmm. roller coaster that you yep. probably just hop off. I actually heard a podcast that's like a uh, review uh, what we do this like three things as a job as a career or as a calling So if we view what we do as a job, yeah, it won't really make you happy because you will be focusing on the money If we view it as a career May make make you happy because you will focus on more on the development of your skill mm -hmm. or whatever but if you view it as a calling you will focus on uh, Doing it because you believe that that will fulfill your happiness that will help people. That's good yep. Nice. Yep. Yeah, Chris Rock has a comedy bit on that. He's like, you know, I got a career. A lot of you see, a lot of you have jobs. <laughs> like, you're <laughs> waiting the clock out. This ain't really work, though. This is not really work. This is my career. You know, some people have jobs. Some people have careers. That's right, because when you got a career, there ain't enough time in the day. There ain't enough time. When you got a career, you look at your watch, time just flies like, whoa, it's 5.35. And I gotta come in early tomorrow and work on my project. Cause there ain't enough time when you got a career. When you got a job, there's too much time. <laughs> That's why like, you look at your watch like, ah, 908. <laughs> then it's just like such a joy to me that it doesn't feel like work. Mm -hmm. That's a career. Like all yeah. of you should have careers. It's like, yeah, yeah. that's true. That's, that's how I actually feel with ministry. I mean, um, you know, just being in it for so long, it's like I thrive off of like new and inventive ways mm -hmm. to try to like share the gospel. And like, um, I lay at bed thinking about it a lot and it's not hard for me to want to come to work. You know, yeah. I'm not dragging yeah. my feet going, I don't wanna be here, I'm gonna do this. <laughs> yep. This is a joy. Let's take a snapshot of some famous people and see what they have to say about being famous. Mm -hmm. 
This is Daniel Radcliffe. You guys have heard of him, right? Yep. Harry yeah. Potter. Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Harry Potter. He'll and, never get away from that. And <laughs> The Good Place. Right. Yeah. Is it yeah, The Good, the good no. Place. Oh, yeah, The Good Place. If you haven't seen The Good Place, there's a reason. Watch YouTube it. shut that video down oh. that we did on The Good Place. That's so true. you guys need to go to patreon.com and find that. We have it up for free. Um, he said the quickest way to forget about the fact that you were being watched was to get very drunk. Mm. And then as you get very drunk, you become aware, oh, people are watching more now because I'm getting very drunk. So I should probably drink more to ignore that. Oh. Not a good philosophy. Wow. That's <laughs> a pretty bad space to be in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, don't, I don't believe that the human being was meant to have so much attention on you. Mm -mm. And that attention is stressful over the course of, of an amount of time, especially if you, you, you became very famous as a child like this. He does not, and he grew up in it. Mm -hmm. So he does not know what it's like to be normal. It's kind of like Michael Jackson to me is, is, is an example of someone who mm -hmm. reached the top of fame and look mm -hmm. how strange he, he <laughs> uh, you know, ended his life. Yeah. And I think that's just a testament to we're not meant to be worshipped. We're not meant mm. for people to, to do this. And it's real easy to just check out of that That's right. because you can't handle it. And yeah. you're not meant to handle it. Even the um, attention we get on this show can be somewhat uncomfortable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> people will make comments and be like, why don't you look happy? I don't understand. Like, <laughs> you look angry or you're quiet today or what have you. I mean, it's yeah. weird just to see the comments that people will make about you right. in the YouTube channel. Um, even that can be unnerving and uncomfortable. I remember we just put out this Instagram video for our t-shirts mm -hmm. and somebody was like commenting on how that was like really out of place for me oh. to be, you know, like in the commercial and like, I guess, be being happy? goofy or something. Mercy. And so uh, <laughs> I was like, oh. Okay. <laughs> oh. No, I am really, serious. Really, tell me how you really feel. <laughs> So anyway, oh, we love you. Keith. Even that can yeah. be unnerving, yeah. right? <laughs> Gigi Hadid. Do you know who this is? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you know? Mm -mm. Supermodel. Still okay. Mm -mm. Here's what she said. <laughs> Sorry. Right. I've lost a lot of friends mm. because I'll get busy for a short period of time, and they're not reaching out. But if I don't reach out, then it's like I've changed. I'm good with the friends I've got. Mm. I wonder, too, if there's a level of intimidation, too. I mean, not only is she pretty, but it's like now all of a sudden you have, she's a supermodel. I mean, I'm sure maybe she gets random phone calls from all the guys that want to, like, hang out with her. But, you know, maybe she's speaking in terms of, of a girl. And maybe mm -hmm. girls just feel more intimidated being around her. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I really, really seriously think, like, being famous is a lo can be a lonely life. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure your friendship circle just like goes like this because now Real friends not everybody can relate to you anymore right I and guess that's, that's why there's such an appreciation for day ones because those people who were with you before all the fame are now with you after mm -hmm. they're able to just mm -hmm. the consistency mm -hmm. it's yeah. refreshing right mm -hmm. yeah. and you know why they're there yeah because they would have been there you know even if regardless you didn't make it. yeah right Idris Elba mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. not really? oh yeah an up and coming star. They've yeah. actually considered him for the a new James Bond role, but mm. that's him and half a dozen other guys. Um, he said this sometimes you're not sure what's real or not, especially when it comes to relationships. Mm. And how you remember how we've been talking like relationships is kind of like the key <laughs> to life, right. yeah. and here they are in these positions of fame, and they're like, I don't even know if my relationships are real. If you're adored by millions, sometimes even when you're on your own front doorstep, you mm -hmm. can become paranoid and constantly question, who is he? Who is she? I know I've been guilty of it in the past. Wow, that's scary. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just not knowing people's intentions. I mean, I can only imagine that's what really, really wealthy people feel as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't like the feeling of being around people, especially if I know, you know, we work in a ministry and, and sometimes, you know, there's a balance between needing to ask for help for certain things. And mm -hmm. yeah. I don't like to be around somebody and then I'm thinking, they're thinking that yeah. I'm thinking <laughs> about their money. <laughs> you know what I mean? And yeah. it's just like, I hate that feeling. Yeah. And I can only imagine being famous like that. You have no idea why people are really there, yeah. you know, especially even, you know, male, female relationships. Like, does that person really care about who I am or mm -hmm. do they only care about 
what comes along with it, you wow. know? Which is why yeah. prenuptial agreements exist, right? Right, right. And why probably many marriages don't exist because you attract yeah. such a wrong type of person. Megan Fox, I'm sure we've all heard of her, right? I've heard yeah. of her. <laughs> I've heard of her. You, yeah. yeah, who's yeah. that? No, I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> What people don't realize is that fame, whatever your worst experience in high school, uh, when you're being bullied by those 10 kids in high school, fame is that, but on a global scale. Wow. Where you're being bullied by millions of people constantly. I, I, I can see that. We, you know, the little amount that we've been, I don't, I don't know if I'd call it bullied, but <laughs> people that are like, like really are maliciously rude on our commenting yeah. and things on our, on our channel, right? If you had that times, you know, 100 million, <laughs> you, that may play with your head a little bit. You yeah. know, if you keep hearing people all the time. And, and she, I remember, had a bit of a, a problem in Hollywood because there was a dis like a dispute between her and the director of the Transformers. Michael Bay. Michael Bay. And then that word got around that she was just difficult to work with and mm. nobody wants to work with her. And so then you've gotten to this place, you've gotten one little piece of fame and then now no one wants to work with you. And maybe she's like that, maybe she's not, I don't know. But the words that people said about her damaged her, her ability to move forward in, in that. And then, um, yeah, it's just like, these people struggle with more than you'd, you'd think. Mm. Like it looks glamorous to us, but you have no idea. The depression, the mm -hmm. you know, anxiety that these people handle is, is, is magnified. I think President Obama did something pretty smart when he was in office. He didn't watch the news. Yeah. You know, he didn't turn it on to see what they were saying about him on, you know, all these nightly television shows or the networks or whatever. He just he didn't watch it because I think it helped him focus on his job. Uh, if you were just drinking that in all the time, it would just do damage to your mental state. Like, oh, they're saying this and all oh, this. You just be agitated yeah. all the time. You just say it's fake news. It's fake <laughs> news. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Lily. <laughs> <laughs> I'm leaving that in for sure. All right, all right. George Clooney. He says, the big house on a hill is isolating. Mm. There is no other way to say it. There are restrictions to this kind of fame. I haven't walked in Central Park for 15 years. I'd like to, you know? Yeah. The view is only nice for so long. Yeah, yeah. it's a fishbowl. <laughs> You're in a fishbowl. Would you like to live in a small fishbowl? I feel I have that feeling. I love fish. I have that feeling towards fish <laughs> and birds. Like I literally love it. But a, a bird in a cage to me is yeah. like, oh, like I want to fly so bad. That Aww. would just be such a joy. And here we took this beautiful little animal and we put it in a box and yeah. we won't let it fly around. And I'm sure that's just exactly what this is like. Yep. Selena Gomez. My self-esteem was shot. I was depressed anxious. I started to have panic attacks right before getting on stage or right after leaving the stage. Basically, I felt I wasn't good enough, wasn't capable. I felt I wasn't giving my fans anything and they could see it, which I think was a complete distortion. What I wanted to say is that life is so stressful and I get the desire to just escape it. All right, so as we're wrapping this thing up, you can guys can see that Here's a whole bunch of famous people, and they're, they're stressed, you mm -hmm. know, in some ways depressed. They're looking at life, you know, like Scotty said, from a fishbowl perspective, it's just like, there are things I can't do. There are relationships that are broken. I have paranoia. It's not all it's cracked up to be. And they have lots of money, mm -hmm. right? And money does not equal their happiness. I just want to close with a couple of thoughts from Luke 18. This is the story of the rich young ruler. Now the point is to not to criticize people who have wealth. That's not what I want to do with this, but to just reinforce uh, people we've been talking about, okay? So here it says in Luke 18, 18 through 21, now a certain ruler asked him saying, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good, that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your mother and your father, and he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. So all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful for he was very rich. Wow. 
you know that that's really interesting because at that point see when you have that much wealth following those other commandments gets increasingly difficult first off your focus is on this wealth and trying to manage it and trying to protect mm-hmm. it from certain people that it gets hard to honor your parents because mm-hmm. now you're like second guessing like well, their intentions it gets hard to love your neighbor as yourself and all these different areas mm-hmm. even to love god because now you're like you're getting this impression to do certain things when you're like wait but that's going to mess with my finances and it's just mm-hmm. the whole thing yes it's possible but it gets more difficult. So I see, you know, I'm, I'm sure Jesus had so many angles to this, but one of them is, you know, redirect your focus. Sell, mm-hmm. you, sell all you have and follow me and see how much, see how invigorating that'll be, how, how easier it would be to follow the commandments to take you to another level. Yeah. yeah. You know, as you were reading this verse, something kind of jumped out at me that I haven't really thought about is before either. When he said, you know, um, good sir, right? Or, and he says, why are you calling me good, mm-hmm. right? Nobody's mm-hmm. good but God. I've always kind of read that like, like almost like, like, don't call me good. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? But it's actually more like he was giving him a window into, you just called me good, and the only person that's good is God. Mm-hmm. I'm God. It was like mm-hmm. an interesting way for mm-hmm. him to reveal to him that he's God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then he literally is giving him the answer to eternal life. Because yeah. if you could ask God, how do I get there? And God answers. And isn't that amazing that mm-hmm. even though he let the guy know, that he was God, he still walked away. And you yeah. can also see how holistic it is. Jesus wasn't a billionaire, millionaire. Did he even have 75 grand? I don't think so. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Bible says he was lowly. He wasn't, you know, attractive physically and all these things. Mm-hmm. Yet someone was able to look at him and say, good, you're good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just having yeah. that peace in Christ, you will get everything that you need. Not yeah. necessarily yeah. what you want, but all your needs will be covered. Yeah. People yeah. will be able to look at you and see Christ. Yeah. Amen. You know, how cool would that have been to have a chair made by Jesus, right? Oh, like, yeah. like a yeah. piece of furniture or something yeah. like this, right? <laughs> and I can just picture Jesus walking over to somebody's house and, and exchanging the chair for money, right? Mm. I'm sure that's probably how he supported himself in his yeah. teenage to college age range, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, I'll make you a chair. It'll cost you, you know, 30 bucks. And I wonder <laughs> if the thought went through his head as he's giving it to you. You know, I made the wood that's the, <laughs> that's the, that's right? the chair sitting on, right? That chair is worth so much money. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Wouldn't that be amazing to follow the line? I would love to see a piece of video, like, where those articles ended up mm-hmm. and how well made they were and how long they lasted. And yeah. Like, wow. You know, interesting yep. thought. That'd be awesome. Well, this man, he walked away from what could have made him truly happy. Mm -hmm. And really, if you think about it, the invitation that Jesus was extending this guy to this guy was to be a part of his inner circle and follow him around. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's, that's huge. This guy might have healed people. He might have written a book of the Bible, right? He might have lived forever, but he brought he bought into the idea that uh, the temporary things of this world were more important. Wow. You know, and Jesus wasn't saying, sell your things and then bring your money and join us. Mm -hmm. He clearly just was like, give it all away and then come and join us. You don't need any of that. Mm -hmm. We don't need any of that. Just come and be with us. Right. Yeah. It's a cool thought. Yeah, it is a cool thought. Jesus wasn't asking him to give him all the money. Right. Yeah, he wasn't like, wow, you're wealthy. You could you really help our operation Finance, out. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't say yeah. that at all. So in all of this, these past three uh, presentations that have been done, um, I, I guess what my, my end thoughts are that we should put our focus on preparing for heaven, not the temporary things of this world, not the lust of the flesh, not the lust of the eyes, not the product of life. And if we look at all three of those temptations, really... It's Satan trying to change um, our desires, trying to move us from devotion to desire, right? That's really been the theme throughout this whole thing. And so um, our desire, I believe, should be to serve Jesus. So you want to be careful what you put into your life, what you allow into your life, what you allow to have influence in your life, Mm -hmm. right? Whether it be people, whether it be money, whether it be movies, whatever it is, you need to be careful what you uh, let influence your, influence your life. And ask yourself, is it worth the cost, right? Is it worth it? Uh, the things of this earth really are empty and disappointing, but that's something that Jesus will never be. Wow. So.
Do you guys have any final thoughts you want to share? I don't know. I just remember the story of Nicodemus somehow. Mm -hmm. You know how he was the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin, right? Yeah. And he was uh, looking for Jesus, but he was too scared of, of the opinion of his fellow Sanhedrin. Mm -hmm. He didn't end up following him. Just imagine if he did. Mm -hmm. It's really sad. Yeah. <laughs> but he was pretty instrumental after the death of Jesus. Right, yeah. And so, you know, I think that's also neat that, that you know, God didn't just say, well, you had your chance. Yeah. Like the, yeah. the other guy, what's his name? P P Pilate? Pilate. Mm -hmm. Pilate. Pilate. Mm -hmm. yeah. He ended up lost. Yeah. 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 Can you imagine if Pilate would have, like, given his heart to God and all of a sudden he's in heaven and, you know, it's like <laughs> you could meet the guy that, like, made the call literally yeah. to kill God. Like, yeah, yeah. It lets you know that they can be used. People of, who are wealthy can be right. used. It's, Absolutely. it's your, your focus, like yeah. who is in your heart. Yeah, I don't think that God is saying you cannot be wealthy. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I just think he's, he's, he's giving a cautionary tale of saying, this is going to be difficult for you to continue in this line with this because of the way that the world treats wealth and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but there are many wealthy people that, that give, you know, to all kinds of different organizations and pieces of God's work and you know I'm sure God has put them in that position to really help work the move the steps forward as well so the funny thing is yeah. he's dumping it right back into their pocket so it's just like yeah. this cycle yeah. it's awesome yeah. yeah wealthy or not famous or not the point is what's your focus mm -hmm. and do you have a great relationship with Jesus and if you do yeah. all right and you keep that up it's all good well, thank you guys for joining us on another episode of LED Live. We encourage you guys to keep watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. We want to hear your guys' feedback in all of this. And uh, we really appreciate how you guys keep coming back week after week. And we hope that you will share this video and the other videos and share it with somebody that it will impact their life because we want to see people change and we want to see people uh, make it to heaven. That's what it's all about. So thank you, and we will see you on the next show. Take care.